In this final video on acute kidney injury, I'll be discussing treatment and complications. The learning objectives are to list the treatments of AKI for common etiologies, to describe common complications of AKI, including acidosis, electrolyte disturbances, toxicity from supertherapeutic medication levels, fluid overload, and uremia, and last, to determine when it's appropriate to initiate hemodialysis. Hopefully, this slide looks familiar from the first video in the series, in which the etiologies of AKI are listed within the pre-renal, intra-renal, post-renal framework. I'm going to use this same framework to discuss approaches to treatment. First are the pre-renal etiologies. These were etiologies of AKI that were related to changes in hemodynamics. So, as a general principle, treating them requires correcting hemodynamic derangements. If cardiac preload is low, that is, if the patient is dehydrated, give them IV fluids. If preload is too high, which would be most commonly from heart failure, administer diuretics. If low contractility from heart failure is also a problem, give afterload reducing agents such as hydralazine, but not ACE inhibitors as they can precipitate AKI. Patients with low contractility may or may not also require inotropes such as dobutamine. For hepatorenal syndrome, the most important thing is to treat the underlying liver disease, if at all possible. If not, there is limited evidence for the possible benefit from the combination of octreotide, midodrin, and albumin, which act as a somatostatin analog, an alpha agonist, and an osmotically active volume expander, respectively. For post-renal etiologies, remember that these are all caused by some form of urinary tract obstruction, so as a general principle, you want to relieve the obstruction. How to do this will necessarily depend on where the obstruction is and what is causing it. If it's a ureteral obstruction, which usually requires bilateral obstruction to lead to AKI, that can be treated with either a percutaneous nephrostomy tube or a fully internal intrauteral stent, a common subtype of which is called a JJ stent. While neurogenic bladders that are characterized by overactivity can be treated pharmacologically, those characterized by hypoactivity cannot. Thus, such patients require intermittent straight caths or a long-term Foley catheter. For patients with AKI due to lower UTIs and subsequent urethral obstruction from inflammation and debris, usually antibiotics alone are sufficient, but a temporary Foley may be necessary in some patients. If it's a medication causing urinary retention, simply stop it. And for obstruction caused by BPH, alpha blockers should be started, but a temporary Foley catheter is frequently used for several weeks to give sufficient time for those meds to work and for renal recovery. Treating intrarenal etiologies of AKI is the most challenging of the three general categories because for most cases, there is not any kidney-specific treatment. Most of these are best addressed by treating the underlying disease. For example, in the most common cause of intrarenal AKI, ATN, although a number of direct interventions have been studied, none have been shown to be helpful. So the only thing to do is to avoid further insult. The one possible exception to the general rule of no specific treatment is with AIN, or acute interstitial nephritis. Steroids such as prednisone can be considered if the patient's renal function fails to improve after discontinuation of the causative medication. However, studies of this intervention are small, conflicting, and do not include any randomized controlled trials. Moving on, when treating a patient with AKI, direct treatment of the AKI is only part of the picture. One must also treat the complications of AKI. There are five broad categories of complications based on five of the kidney's functions in normal healthy individuals. First, the kidneys are responsible for maintaining water homeostasis, which is another way of saying it maintains normal blood volume. If this function is impaired and the kidneys don't produce as much urine volume as normal, the immediate pathophysiologic consequence is volume overload. Symptoms of this are edema and dyspnea, and the significant downstream pathologic consequences are heart failure and pulmonary edema. The kidneys also maintain electrolyte homeostasis. The most immediate pathophysiologic consequences are hypertension on account of sodium retention, hyperkalemia, 
and hyperphosphatemia. Which of these develops first and which becomes dangerous first varies between patients. These electrolyte abnormalities are typically asymptomatic up until a life-threatening complication develops, which includes hypertensive emergency, arrhythmias, and sudden cardiac death. The kidneys maintain acid-base balance by regenerating bicarbonate in the proximal tubule and excreting hydrogen ions in the distal tubule. When this function is disrupted, the immediate consequence is of course a metabolic acidosis. Mild metabolic acidosis is asymptomatic, but as it worsens, patients may develop dyspnea as their respiratory drive increases due to the falling pH. When metabolic acidosis becomes severe, that is when it causes the pH to drop to less than about 7.20, a number of problems can start to develop on account of, pro of protein function starting to be adversely impacted. This includes hypotension, arrhythmias, and a lack of responsiveness when exogenous pressors are administered to help support a falling blood pressure. Nitrogen-containing waste products from normal metabolism are eliminated by the kidneys as urea. When urea levels rise, patients develop the syndrome of uremia, which consists of fatigue, nausea, poor appetite, and confusion. There are two specific clinical entities that are seen in uremia, uremic encephalopathy, which is manifested by confusion, drowsiness, disorientation, slurred speech, and impaired memory, and uremic pericarditis, which manifests as positional chest pain, ECG changes, and in some patients, the development of a pericardial effusion. The last function of the kidneys relevant to this discussion is their role in eliminating medications and their metabolites. If this function is impaired, the consequence is toxic drug levels, which can lead to various symptoms and downstream problems, depending upon the specific medication in question. Several of these complications warrant specific discussion, in particular, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, and toxic drug levels. Risks from hyperkalemia are primarily life-threatening arrhythmias, which as previously implied, can occur before the onset of other symptoms. The probability of arrhythmias in hyperkalemia is related to the degree of hyperkalemia, the acuity of onset, and the presence of hyperkalemia-related ECG changes, such as peaked T waves. So for example, a potassium of 6.5 in a patient with chronic kidney disease and a completely normal ECG is less immediately concerning than a potassium of 6.0 in a patient with acute kidney injury and peaked T waves on ECG. Emergent and or urgent treatment of hyperkalemia is generally reserved for patients with ECG changes, active arrhythmias, or other symptoms. Treatments for hyperkalemia fall into two categories. There are rapidly acting therapies, the beneficial effect of which is transient. These are meds that either antagonize the effect of hyperkalemia, such as IV calcium, or meds which act by redistributing potassium from the extracellular space to the intracellular space, such as insulin, given with glucose to prevent hypoglycemia, albuterol, and sodium bicarbonate. These have only modest benefit and a duration of action ranging from one to several hours, so should be seen as temporizing measures only. Then there are therapies which act by eliminating potassium from the body altogether. Loop diuretics such as furosemide can cause the kidneys to excrete potassium. However, it is usually contraindicated and or ineffective in patients with AKI, particularly in those who are already volume depleted. Another option is caexalate, which is an oral medication that binds potassium in the GI tract, causing the patient to eliminate it in the feces. Although this is frequently the go-to treatment for hyperkalemia for many doctors, the evidence of its effectiveness is surprisingly underwhelming. The definitive treatment for life-threatening hyperkalemia is renal replacement therapy, such as dialysis. For a patient with hyperkalemia-related arrhythmias or severe ECG changes, all of these other therapies, even caexalate, should be viewed as a temporary treatment while getting dialysis set up. As already mentioned, risks from a profoundly low pH include arrhythmias, 
decreased cardiac contractility and vasodilation, which lead to hypotension, and decreased pressor responsiveness. However, simple administration of sodium bicarb may paradoxically worsen the patient's clinical status. One such mechanism is because it may result in the PCO2 in the CSF rising faster than the CSF's concentration of bicarb, which could lead to neurological deterioration. As a general rule, sodium bicarb, either PO, but more commonly IV, can be considered once the pH drops into the 7.10 to 7.20 zone. However, there are no RCTs that have examined the effect of bicarb given in patients with AKI and metabolic acidosis. But two very small RCTs showed no hemodynamic benefit when bicarb was given to patients with moderate lactic acidosis and pHs in the approximate range of 7.1 to 7.2. The bottom line with bicarb is that many clinicians become tempted to give it at a relatively modest degree of acidosis because it seems like an obvious, direct way to correct a metabolic derangement. Bicarb is low, so let's give some bicarb back. But just keep in mind that there are theoretical downsides and no proven benefit. Now, let's talk AKI and medications. Irrespective of the etiology of AKI, all patients warrant discontinuation of nephrotoxic drugs. Consideration of temporary discontinuation of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which aren't nephrotoxic per se, but can alter GFR. Avoidance of iodinated contrast for CT scans and procedures, such as cardiac caths. And all continued medications should be renally dosed, meaning their dosages and frequencies should be adjusted for the patient's current renal function. When doing this, keep in mind that equations used to estimate GFR from serum creatinine necessarily require stable renal function, which patients with AKI don't have. Therefore, when in doubt, consult with a pharmacist. There are many, many medications that need to be dose adjusted or altogether discontinued in AKI. However, there are some for which this problem comes up more frequently than others either because the medications are more commonly prescribed in general, or because they have a particularly narrow therapeutic window, or a particularly dangerous side effect profile. The particularly dangerous cardiovascular meds include diuretics, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs, because they can all further worsen renal function in AKI. And digoxin, atenolol, and sodalol are all renally excreted and can cause life-threatening arrhythmias at supertherapeutic doses. Diabetes meds are another group that are common problems in AKI. Insulin itself is renally excreted, so insulin doses may need to be lowered. Despite common belief to the contrary, metformin appears safe in chronic kidney disease, but its safety in acute kidney injury has not been established, and it's strongly recommended to discontinue it. The sulfonylureas, particularly gliburide, are at a higher risk of causing hypoglycemia in AKI. Of all the other classes of medications to be cautious of in AKI, the biggest problems are seen with antibiotics, especially vancomycin and the aminoglycosides, morphine, which is renally cleared, NSAIDs, which are nephrotoxic via multiple different mechanisms, and lithium, which is renally cleared and has a very narrow therapeutic window. There is one complication left to discuss, which is not a complication of AKI, but a potential complication of treatment. It's something called a post-obstructive diuresis. In a significant minority of patients with AKI due to urinary obstruction, relief of the obstruction will be followed by heavy urine output for a period of hours to a couple of days. The mechanism or mechanisms behind this phenomenon are not entirely clear. For most patients, the high urine output will stop once the body approaches eubulimia, but occasionally it continues, resulting in hypotension. So the bottom line, after relief of obstruction, keep an eye on the urine output and consider giving some fluid back if a patient is trending towards hypovolemia. The final topic I'll discuss is renal replacement therapy, colloquially referred to as dialysis. There are five general indications for starting emergent dialysis, which can be remembered with the mnemonic a-E-I-O-U.
A stands for acidosis. Typically, once the pH drops to below 7.10 to 7.20, although there is no specific cutoff. E is for electrolytes, most specifically life-threatening hyperkalemia. I for intoxication, referring to medication toxicity or toxic ingestion. Ingestions for which this should be a consideration include lithium, aspirin, methanol, and ethylene glycol. O for overload or fluid overload, and U for uremia, particularly for patients with uremic encephalopathy or pericarditis. It's important to note that the initiation of dialysis in AKI is not triggered by any specific creatinine or GFR. I've seen patients with a creatinine of 10 mg per deciliter who have not needed dialysis, while others require dialysis with a creatinine of 4. This isn't meant to be a video about the mechanics of dialysis, but to give you a very basic idea of how it works, it takes blood from the patient's body, arterial blood in conventional hemodialysis, and runs it through something called a dialyzer. A dialyzer contains a semi-permeable membrane in which the patient's blood flows along one side and an exogenous fluid of water and electrolytes called dialysate or colloquially called the bath flows along the other. Water, electrolytes, and small molecules like urea can pass through the membrane while proteins and blood cells cannot. The used dialysate that comes out the other end of the dialyzer is discarded in a waste container while the filtered, clean blood is returned to the body. For patients requiring renal replacement therapy for AKI, there are two main options. There is intermittent hemodialysis, also commonly known as just plain hemodialysis, or HD. Intermittent hemodialysis is when a patient is hooked up to the machine for three to four hours, about three times a week. As a general rule, this modality is more common. The alternative is something called continuous renal replacement therapy, which is an umbrella term to describe a variety of similar therapies, the most common of which in the U.S. is called CVVH, for con continuous venovenous hemofiltration, which, as the name implies, runs most, if not all day, every day. This modality minimizes rapid fluid shifts, so it's often preferred in hemodynamically unstable patients. As you might have already wondered about, the common practice of referring to intermittent hemodialysis as just hemodialysis is potentially misleading since some continuous renal replacement therapies are actually forms of hemodialysis too. But since intermittent hemodialysis is so much more common, if you hear someone on the wards referring to just hemodialysis, they are almost certainly referring to this. The optimal timing to start renal replacement therapy in AKI is subjective and controversial. Reasons to favor earlier timing include the ability to remove toxins that may have significant downstream effects not immediately apparent. It also simplifies the treatment of some critically ill patients, such as those with severe volume overload or severe acidemia. The primary reason to favor delayed timing is that many patients with severe AKI may still recover without ever requiring RRT. This is particularly true of patients with either pre-renal or post-renal etiologies, with the exception of hepatorenal syndrome. Since RRT exposes the patient to additional risk from the procedure necessary to obtain vascular access, is relatively expensive, and requires additional equipment and trained staff, there are many advantages to avoiding treatment if it's possible to do so. Another consideration to the timing is how quickly the AKI is expected to improve. However, the bottom line is that the literature evidence comparing early versus delayed timing is conflicting and the question remains unanswered. That concludes this video on the treatment and complications of acute kidney injury. If you found it to be helpful, please remember to like and share it.